There we go. Okay. <laughs> So hello everyone, all, all seven of you. Uh, no, there's only six of you because I'm counting myself. Um, it's it's really nice to be with you today. Again, my name is Bruce Reitherman, Kathy, and we've met Zulima, we've met, but only just recently and briefly. Lewis, I'm I'm don't know if I've met you before, but I hope I haven't and just forgotten. Anyway, welcome to you all. Um, I'm the conservation director here. I've been here at the Land Trust for about 10 years. Uh, the conservation director for about the last six. And uh, by way of describing what I do here, I would just tell you that my responsibilities are many and the work of conservation in this region is incredibly diverse. But my passion for the career is really just grounded in a, a, a love for the natural world and a, a simple desire to want to protect the precious pieces of landscape and habitat that we still have left even as at the same time, we support the agricultural community that's so much a part of the conservation legacy of this place we all call home. So I'm gonna um, turn on my, share my screen here with you for a little PowerPoint presentation that might give you a little more visual feeling for the sorts of things we'll be talking about today. I'm hoping you see a great big thing that says California Tiger Salmon. Oh, no, you don't yet, wait. Now I hope you do. Yes. Yep. So um, uh, I, I want to I try to explain a little bit about um, how, if those are the goals that I have for, for the protection of the, or the organization and the land trust has in general for the protection of these precious places, I want to give you a feeling for um, a number of strategies that we have tried to use to find willing landowners and find and then secure sources of funding that can incentivize landowners to, uh, to do a conservation deal with us. And then lastly, to develop um, trusting relationships with uh, landowners and funding agencies alike, because um, their confidence that we can take taxpayer dollars and put them to good use for conservation purposes is really fundamental to everything we, we get done here at the Land Trust. So one of the more interesting creatures that's found in this region uh, that uh, has actually provided the land trust with, with a way to achieve all three of these goals. And that creature is the California tiger salamander. I'll probably abbreviate this from now on to CTS, California tiger salamander, CTS. Um, it's, it's an acronym, I apologize for that. California tiger salamander is a bit of a, a mouthful as is Ambistoma californiense, the scientific name. Um, if I call it a CTS, I hope you'll know that we're talking about this cute little uh, creature. Um, I'll start by describing a little bit about its general biology because I think it's really fascinating. I'll depict a bit of the distribution of this creature over the landscape and why they're so special in Santa Barbara. I'll outline some of the challenges that they face, which are, which are numerous and grave to some extent. And then I'll finish by focusing on some of our successful effort, efforts to protect the species through land conservation, the ways we've used federal and state dollars to conserve habitat and grazing lands that are important to this, and indeed very many other species of wildlife where this animal happens to live. And I'll tell you a little bit about some of the plans we have for the future. So to get started rather simply, um, CTS are amphibians. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, they are sort of six to eight inches long in their adult form, which is this happy little fellow up here on the right-hand side. They're protected by law in the state of California by both federal, state, uh, federal and, and state Endangered Species Act legislation. And an interesting thing about the way they live and a part of how they have to be thought about in terms of conservation and that the habitats that you um, protect for them is that they go through various stages in their life. All three of these pictures are the same animal. It's just a different stage of life. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we progress forward in the presentation. Salamanders as a group are colorful and diverse. They can vary in size from a creature that can curl up quite comfortably on your thumbnail to one as big as a six foot tall, 200 pound person. And if you're having trouble picturing that, and if you've ever met me, just picture me with a slimy skin spotted with little yellow spots um, and a tail, and you'll have a feeling for how, how incredibly um, 
plastic and how um, varied the form of a salamander can be in tape. These are just a few of the ones that occupy uh, mostly Western California, uh, Western United States or California. Uh, North America uh, happens to be a, a hot spot. Eastern North America, for especially, uh, is uh, one of the global hot spots for diversity of, of different sal salamander species. And what's interesting about them is that in many ways, especially in certain habitats like the ones we we find salamanders in here in California, they can be abundant and can go unseen even by people who spend their entire lives in their midst. They are also ancient. Salamanders and their frog cousins trace their ancestry back to a time when life on earth really meant life underwater. The animals at the top of the chart here all evolved rather early in the, well, if you follow this line back, you go through about 300 million years of animals that were single-celled and very primitive and, and um, uh, you know, remarkable in their own way. But by the time you get something that starts to have a backbone, becomes a vertebrate as we call them, the animals that we kind of think of most typically as animals, uh, you'll see that amphibians come along very quickly before be, as, as, as fish evolved into something that could climb out of the water, crawl around on land, and eventually even fly in the sky. This figure shows you a similar sort of um, family tree, evolutionary tree. And you'll see again here that amphibians are down here at a place that comes after a lot of the stuff that swam around in the, in the primordial oceans for many, many years. I just wanna give you a sense too that amphibians are more closely related in many ways to fish than they are to the other things that they kind of look like, like reptiles, amphibians, frogs, especially salamanders look a lot like lizards but they aren't any more closely related to them than they are to the tuna fish that you might get in your sandwich. Also want to just point out that, um, you know, Jurassic is meant to be, as in Jurassic Park, the movie, it's meant to be the period in time when most people associate, uh, you know, deep history with the era of the dinosaurs. But as you can get, uh, you can tell from just a glance of the dinosaurs, um, when they came along in the, the 160, 100, almost 200 million years ago, uh, the amphibia had been around for 100 million years before that. Very ancient and very interesting indeed. And, and they still are here in that form to a large extent. Many of them preserve the very form that they've had unchanged for tens of millions of years. So when you look at a salamander now, you literally are looking at, um, I suppose a living fossil isn't even really right the, the right word at all. You're, you're really looking at a, almost back in time as it were, to an animal that, um, that predates the time when, uh, when all the other animals we kind of associate with life on earth actually managed to evolve and, and take, take other different more interesting forms. They are typically rather small, um, you know, six, eight inches long is rather typical for them. Partly that uh, has to do with the fact that they don't have much in the way of lungs. They have to breathe through their skin, which is quite a trick. Um, effectively, they, they carry almost a little aquatic environment on their backs in the mucus secretions that, uh, that give them kind of a slimy feel if you pick them up and, and, uh, and, and touch them at all. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, especially with all the, the bright coloration that uh, tends to characterize the, the group, um, they're, not, they're poisonous to a large extent. Um, a close relative of, of our coast range newt, the um, uh, rough skin newt. Uh, has one of the most powerful toxins um, known to the animal kingdom. Um, even a little tiny fragment of it, if it gets ingested by a frog or a, a fish or, or other reptiles, birds, mammals, um, it can be really um, sickening to them and even kill them. They're cold-blooded, they move slow. And a handy little trick is that they can regenerate an entire limb or most of their tail, um, which um, some lizards can regenerate tails. But regenerating an entire limb is quite a trick. Um, as I mentioned, they're mostly found in, in, uh, in North America, in New England, but critically here in California, they are abundant in certain places where there is water. Ponds like this one are critical to the survival of CTS in Santa Barbara County. And that's because for at least a part of their lives, as their name implies, they are both amphi, they are both terrestrial and aquatic. So here's a little schema that gives you a sense of how eggs might be laid, 
they mature into this funny little aquatic larvae, we'll call him and talk about it in a minute. They metamorphose into this kind of juvenile uh, form before they become the full adult. And let me just dive in just a little um, deeper, haha, if I may, to, um, to, to describe what happens in each of these different um, periods. So they breed only once in their lives. They may live to about 10 years, but yeah, sort of seven, eight years into their lives, they'll, they'll climb down off the hillside and, and walk back into a pond that's full of water from winter rains. And a female can lay several hundred to two, 300 eggs at a time. The males and females congregate there in the ponds and um, the eggs get attached to little random bits of debris. Uh, after a few weeks, those hatch into what we call larvae. This one's actually probably two or three months old already, but in the earliest stages, they have no legs at all. They just have a tail and these great big feathery gills like fish have, although fish tend to con conceal them inside a, a flap and a perculum on the side of the head, but they have these gills that allow them to, to breathe underwater and do so very effectively in a water that contains very, very little oxygen sometimes. Um, they continue to grow and develop into this little fellow who is maybe another month or month and a half, five weeks older than this guy. The, the limbs now are quite robust. They're not just little kind of wobbly appendages. They can actually support their weight. They've resorbed all the gills or almost all the gills. Uh, their tail has become uh, flattened and, and rounded. These flaps have gone away and become resorbed um, into the body and transformed into a new feature. Um, and then uh, this uh, metamorph, they call it, because it's, 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 a, it's a metamorphic uh, transition uh, form between the larvae and the adult, that metamorph, uh, metamorph turns into uh, a fully formed adult. This guy's actually probably several years old. Um, their first year, they look a little bit more uh, juvenile, but um, begin to take on that, that final adult form. So salamanders aren't, aren't just links between us and the past in an evolutionary sense, but they're also so in an embryological one. Um, almost every first year student who takes a genetics class in college will hear the phrase, phylogeny recapitulates ontogeny. Very fancy words in some, in some ways, but simply that they mean that the evolutionary progress of all life on earth is repeated in the embryological development of an individual species. And so amphibians do this process by which they sort of start out as fish and turn into something that's intermediary and become almost sort of like a lizard. They go through that transformation long after they've come out of the egg. Um, it's, a, it's a feature that's uh, common to all life on earth, but uh, uh, amphibians sort of show it to us because they do it outside the egg. I think this is kind of interesting. It gives us a little feeling for how as a larvae in a, in a muddy pool, they come up and gulp air sometimes to get a little dose of extra uh, oxygen into the, their systems. And oh, let me get rid of that. You can see that they are um, in the aquatic environment as larvae. Opportunistic predators. That one just ate a little uh, tadpole of a uh, chorus frog that um, provides a good source of food in these ponds. More than one species of, of, of amphibian can come to breed and they make food for, or for the salamanders who are the only um, uh, carnivorous predators among them. All the other ones who are really just eating pond, pond vegetation. And then in the whole circle of life, turn about as fair play kind of mode, uh, as the pond dries up especially, the, the larvae and the, the young juveniles become vulnerable to other predators like this aquatic garter snake. Um, in the larval phase, they're not as toxic as the adults are and, and birds and mammals and snakes can take quite a toll. So I often say about almost all of the things we do with regards to wildlife conservation is that it's not enough to know about the animals. You have to have places where they can live. And in the case of the salamander, uh, habitat uh, is two different things. It's aquatic because I've just described they need to breed in it. But in a second here, I'll show you some examples of how uh, habitat requires upland sites, uh, terrestrial sites that they can crawl into where they spend most of their lives. Uh, the fact that these ponds are relatively shallow means that they don't last the whole year. They are ephemeral. And that means they dry out, which means that nobody else can live in there. 
frogs, other kinds of reptiles that might be, uh, uh, or amphibians, in fact, toads and things that as adults could be predators on salamanders. They can't live there through the whole year. So the amphibians take advantage of the fact that the first rains that fall in December or November, which is the picture that's, that's, that's included here, um, provide them with a, a clean slate where they can go in and begin their uh, breeding activity without uh, any competitors to speak of. And as the seasons progress and you know, November, early December turns into January, the rains come and they go and the pond fills and it decreases depending upon how windy it's been and how hot and sunny it has been until by you know, late May or perhaps even early June, you end up with a pond that has decreased to the point that salamanders had better get gone very quickly or they'll be in that fish-like stage at a time when there's no water to swim in. So at about this stage, you'll often find that there's a mass migration of these metamorphs that take off for the, for the grasslands and oak woodlands that are uphill from the pond. The habitat requirements that they need as they get uphill from the ponds um, boils down to a couple things, but really fundamentally, it's about, it's about holes in the ground. It's about burrows that they can inhabit because Salamanders live most of their lives sheltering in these burrows and probably coming out frequently on winter nights when it's wet and rainy and their little slimy skins can handle the, the, the conditions and not get too dried out. They'll come out onto the surface of the ground and, and forage for insects and other things like that, but they spend an awful lot of time in the, in the burrow. And those burrows were all created by some kind of what we call fossorial, you know, digging mammal. Uh, gopher holes can, can suffice, badger holes and things like that. but um, what, what a salamander really needs is a place that's wet for about four and a half months and then a hillside uphill from there where they can find uh, gopher holes and, and squirrel holes where they can shelter. And they stay relatively close to the pond. Um, studies have demonstrated with really a high degree of certainty that uh, about a, a mile and a quarter is the farthest that an individual salamander can travel from the pond where they were born which is really quite interesting when you think about ponds as being speckled all over the landscape and how can animals move between ponds. If they're more than a mile and a quarter from each other, it's gonna to be tough. It's gonna to happen only relatively rarely under condition when conditions are very perfect for that, for that particular thing to happen. So the ponds themselves form a real focus, a real locus around which our concentration is, is really um, concentrated. Uh, our, our attention is really concentrated because that's the, that's the really the key to making sure that they can stay alive in this world. So good ponds like this are, and the surrounding habitat are really important. And the problem for CTS in Santa Barbara County is that much of what was historically prime habitat that might've looked like this in and around the Santa Maria Valley, for example, especially has become this. It's been laser leveled to control the water runoff in ways that don't interrupt the you know, agricultural activity there. And the fields have been plowed for, um, for the cultivation of really high value crops. And uh, that's a reality of the world we live in. Um, it's, it's when the land trust tries to, to work with in order to, to find good solutions that, that serve everyone's needs. But the reality as far as the, the salamander goes is that they've got precious little habitat to work with. Especially when you add in urban sprawl or expansion that's taken up, uh, again, an awful lot of good farmland, which is kind of a tragedy, but has also occupied land that in the past would have been, even just 100 years ago or 70 years ago, would have been rolling sand dunes um, of uh, sort of Aeolian age, of a prehistoric age, when the ocean uh, was washing back and forth across this landscape of living pine sand dunes, between each of which there would have been likely little ponds that could have supported the kinds of activity that salamanders need, the kind of habitat that they need. So all of that's kind of boiled down to a little bit of a conservation crisis. Uh, the animal is only found in California, as this map suggests, but it's found, um, they've done so much work now on the genetics of the animals that live in the area that they've, just, they've divided the species up into six, what they call distinct population segments. Um, that means that each of these colored areas has a, a distinct genetic character that is different from the others. And interestingly, the Santa Barbara DPS, distinct population segment, appears to have been isolated from all the others for so long 
that if there are differences between the green and the orange and the yellow up here, the difference between all of these and Santa Barbara is much greater. So Santa Barbara really is its own unique thing, which in some ways might almost deserve, depending upon how the scientists choose to split this stuff up, its own species designation, which doesn't really matter as far as the salamanders go, but is an interesting little um, feature that gives you a sense of how um, precious uh, the Santa Barbara population is, even though the species is somewhat more widespread. It's worth saying that it's all, it's, it's all, it has problems in its entire range for a, a number of feet, uh, reasons, um, but um, Santa Barbara, you know, suffers from the same problems, the same challenges, but it's its own unique thing, and so it really deserves its own special attention. I've mentioned that habitat loss is really the prime reason why the species is having such a hard time. But there are two other things that are related. And they have to do with genetic inbreeding, or, or rather inbreeding that's based on a, a really small gene pool that, that individuals are, are very closely related, that are breeding with each other in these ponds, and they're creating what's known as a low reproductive vigor. They're creating a condition where the animals that survive aren't very fit, they aren't very vigorous, they aren't very, um, uh, they aren't they aren't cut out for survival. They're going to be they're going to be eliminated before they survive to the age where they can breed and and reproduce their own kind. And if you zoom in on just that Santa Barbara distinct population segment, it turns out that like little Russian dolls, uh, there are distinctions, um, important ones between the different what they call meta populations, the little different portions of the the range of the the CTS. These colored areas um, are each rather rather distinct from each other genetically. And again, interestingly, these four metapopulations that are all located down here to the south side of the, of the range within Santa Barbara County, these are all different from each other, but rather similar to each other when compared to these two up here. And again, you can make the case, some taxonomists, some, some of the scientists that, that worry about how to name animals, um, some, some taxonomists have suggested that um, we really have, you know, three different, two different species of, of, of California tiger salamander. You'd have to give it a new name, but th uh, two different subsets of, of California tiger salamanders with important genetic distinctions already live in Santa Barbara. Um, and Santa Barbara suffers from the same problems, challenges that I mentioned. So I just want to give you a quick feeling for how we know all this stuff about their genetics. You can't just walk up and ask them. Uh, it takes a little bit more hard work and. Um, uh, intellect uh, than, than that. Um, and thankfully, there is a whole bunch of really um, clever people who are at it. Um, it boils down to dragging a net of one kind or another through the water in places where we expect to find them. And if you're lucky, um, you pull in a net that is full of dozens, sometimes a couple hundred California tiger salamander larvae. These probably have, a, well, maybe six weeks, a month or six weeks to go before they would begin to metamorphose into their adult form. You can still see their, their gills, yeah. uh, which are rather small. And you can see these little stubby limbs that have just begun to grow, just begun to grow. Um, and in any given pond, you can find an, uh, animals um, of different ages, you know, depending on when the when the rainfall events happened, when it, when the adults went down to the pond and bred, and then when your visit occurs, if it's early in the season, you may find animals that are relatively small or relatively large. In fact, even in a single pond, you can sometimes come up with individuals that um, are they kind of group into what we call cohorts or, or group, you know, age groups, as it were, where you've got animals that clearly have been here for many months. These were the product of breeding events that happened very early in the winter. And then medium ones that maybe happened in, you know, there's another big rain in, in, in mid-January where more adults came down and, and caused another breeding event to occur. And then even smaller ones that are, you know, were uh, produced more recently. And, and at times you can find even the very tiniest of larvae. Um, usually, however, um, in a pond uh, where you have big ones like this, you don't have any of the other really small ones because the big ones have eaten all the small ones in the process of becoming big themselves. They will, they will cannibalize on the, uh, the younger uh, CTS larvae that are swimming around in the same pond. Once the animals are collected, um, they are measured and 
examined two or three different ways, and then a little piece of their tail is snipped off, uh, sent to a genetics laboratory, it's analyzed, and then those, those data that are, that are generated are compared to other individuals and populations. And that's how we get those maps that I showed you a minute ago that are um, really incredibly de detailed pictures of what is something you cannot see with the naked eye. If you were to hold up animals, adult animals, for example, that have been collected in all those different spots I showed you on the maps earlier, you'd have a really hard time holding two of them in, in your two hands and saying, oh, this one's from Sonoma County, and oh, this one's from Santa Barbara. It only reveals itself at the genetic level, and so it takes a more sophisticated analysis to, to reveal it. And then once the sampled individuals um, are uh, processed, then they're just plopped back in the water. And um, studies have demonstrated that they're no worse for wear. They survive quite happily with a little tip of their tail gone. It's important to be aware that in a species like this, where a couple of, it, of adults can make many, maybe a couple hundred, 300 offspring, you have to find ways to evaluate how many of these little guys actually survive to maturity and return to the pond to breed. The results of the genetic analysis, along with a number of really clever field studies, are important in teasing out the right answer, the right conclusion from the apparent one. Because when you look at a net full of larvae, it makes it look like they're doing just great. But the conclusion um, that um, most of the people, the, the researchers working in Santa Barbara County have come to is that because they are severely inbred, because all of these individual salamanders are like brothers and sisters to each other, and that that's gone on in these ponds for many, many years now, that they're really not very vigorous and that very few of them are surviving to the age in a condition that's strong enough that they'll actually create offspring to continue the species. It's an interesting little bit of biology with a species that creates a lot of young that you can't assume that a whole bunch of youngsters mean a healthy population. But if habitat have a con conversion, like those pictures I showed you earlier, agricultural and, and urban conversion has been bad for CTS in terms of habitat, happily cattle ranching, with its need to provide water for cattle on uphill spots where water wouldn't have existed before has been a very positive um, assist to uh, conservation of, of salamanders in, in Santa Barbara County. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a rare case when something like cattle ranching and the preservation of endangered species, not, not I shouldn't say rare, it's, a, um, it's not, it's, it's not uncommon that that can be the case, that and conservation of endangered species and variety of agricultural uses of open space like, like cattle ranching are compatible. But in the case of salamanders, California tiger salamanders, it's just a happy coincidence that um, it works out very well. Cattle have been actually good for salamander conservation as opposed to bad for it in most cases. So the significance of all this, when you come back to the mission of the land trust, which is about the conservation of land, not so much focusing on individual species, but on the land itself and you know, making sure that there are places for all these great animals to live and thrive, is that we've managed to use the California tiger sal salamander to protect um, more than a thousand acres of ranch land that might've potentially been uh, vulnerable to development at some point in the future. And that in itself is a pretty good start. We've also managed to cultivate um, Sources of funding, significant sources of funding that have amounted to millions of dollars through the last few years uh, that have conserved these properties. And that's, that's, a, that's a thing that happens because we, I would like to think that um, our staff produces pretty compelling grant applications, but it's also due to the fact that we just hang out with these people quite a bit. We work with them. We have a certain credibility. Um, we speak their language and that results in trust and there's nothing um, more important to generating support for the work we do and trust. And then perhaps one of the things I'm most proud of is that we've deepened relationships with landowners. Some of these families go back eight generations. They've been here for a very long time. They have, um, they've taken care of the land the best way they mm. I think you might have froze. We'll just give it a second. 
Can you hear me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, the, I, I, I take a certain amount of pride in the idea that we are, um, hang on, let's see if this goes away. That, that we are simultaneously protecting land while we're protecting legacies. We're protecting the, the, the livelihoods of people who have lived here for a very long time. And so in this particular case, at least, we're finding win-win solutions that are good for people and endangered species alike. So despite the challenges I've sketched out for you, the future for CTS is not all gloomy. We do have a bunch of whole smart, dedicated biologists working hard to find ways of dealing with these issues um, related to genetic diversity and inbreeding that I mentioned. While conservationists led by the land trust largely in Santa Barbara County are helping to ensure that there will always be these places protected in perpetuity where CTS and a bunch of other animals can find a place to thrive in this world that we share with them. The Land Trust is working hard on a number of other projects that we hope will continue to leverage the work we've already managed to uh, uh, find success with, uh, managed to leverage the acres that we protected and the funding that we've managed to make flow to this part of the world and the relationships that have made all that possible to keep providing these multiple benefits for a variety of stakeholders within the very diverse parts of the community inside this county, all of which we think of as a duty to serve. So in a world that's changing pretty fast, I do continue to think that conservation really does matter. There, there's nothing more fundamental to conservation than the protection of biodiversity, which really is again, sort of a fancy scientific sounding word that means nothing less than the miraculous variety of life itself. It's a fundamental building block of everything that's about conservation. And that activity, that conservation is really hard work and it requires innovative solutions as we move forward into a world that changes day by day. But in this particular case, protecting CTS has proven to be a really critical aid in the land trust mission, leading the conservation of huge acreage, acreages that have, that have been really useful for other plants and animals, are great to look at, uh, may even provide um, sources of, uh, of recreation and access in the future. And where cattle ranchers and, and, and other people involved in agriculture can continue with their businesses and their lives. So it's not all rosy, but it's not all grim. There's still a lot of work to do, uh, but I think this is a problem we can solve if we just put our minds and our hearts into it. <laughs> Such a cute picture at the end. Awesome. Well, thank you, Bruce. We really appreciate you just taking the time to share that with us. But I guess I just want to open it up, see Kathy, Lewis, anybody have any questions? I, I have one. Um, it didn't look like the habitat went down to Arroyo Honda. Have you ever seen them down there? I know that the species doesn't go down that far. They really like these little um, ponded features that are typical for more rolling flat hill country like where they have in the Cedar Santa Rita Hills or the Parisima Hills. The, the Gaviota Coast is, I suppose, too steep and there aren't enough little um, pondy depressions to really create good habitat for them. They don't tend to like creeks and things. Um, the, oh. the Coast Range Newt, which is the salamander you may have seen. At, yeah. uh, they're abundant, obviously, but they breed in, in running water along with red-legged frogs and other species that like the, the current. Um, these salamanders, um, they really rely on that, that idea that the pond will go away and they'll have it all to themselves as the first rains fill it up the coming year. <laughs> I hadn't noticed, you can actually see the, the little teeth starting to form on the inside of this guy's mouth. Remarkable creatures. Uh, Bruce, hi, I'm uh, Louis Andaloro with the uh, Santa Barbara Urban Creeks Council. Oh, hey. and, my, and my question for you, is you showed us a map of uh, six different populations of uh, the tiger salamander in the Santa Maria Valley. And the question is, of those populations, are any of them like very stable or extremely imperiled or are they all kind of a mishmash? So I think this is maybe the map that we were thinking about. Oops, hang on, sorry. This is the map we were talking about. And yeah, interesting question. The, um, 
let me let me do this actually. Let me quickly. How do I? How do I? How do I? How do I? Well, mm, and I, and I know how I can do this. If I do that, there we go. If I do this now, I'm showing you a Google Earth image. And one thing I'll just point out to you is that if the historic range of the salamander occupied this whole area, well, there's precious little of that that isn't in either Agland or some kind of urban environment, right? It, it, the, the populations were never separated before um, by this big band of, of uh, urban uh, development. You see the airport. Oh, no. You're frozen, Bruce. Yeah. <laughs> frozen? I may be, uh, I may be overworking the, the thing as I move my Google Earth back and forth. So I'll leave it about like that. But so my point is that there's different parts of their, their range that have been more heavily impacted by habitat destruction than others. Um, these two are by far the most imperiled and they're the most, most difficult to figure out how to conserve because there's really almost nothing left in this meta population, for example. Over here, most of the impacts have occurred down here where most of the ponds were located, but there are in fact a whole bunch of ponds in these foothills that either do contain CTS now or might be able to contain them if we help them a little bit with um, some careful science that might reintroduce them or, or introduce them for the first time to ponds that otherwise have, have great habitat value. As you move down into the middle of the, this may freeze again, I'll just move it and then stop. But as you move down here into these other four meta populations, much more rural, much more cattle grazing, um, the opportunities there are greater in most cases, I suppose. But boy, this East Los Alamos meta population, for example, has real problems. Um, while it's these, these colored areas suggest that there is a very large area there are only a few ponds within there that really provide great habitat at this point. So, um, you know, they might be at the corners of the, of the area, but you still only have four or five ponds. The color and the size of the thing isn't indicative of how vigorous the, the population within it really is. So your question though is, 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 um, is nuanced, but the answer is that each of them have their own set of, of, um, of challenges and, and opportunities. You know, if I were to turn on a picture of, some of the conserved lands where we've already done good work, um, you might see that some of these populations are already pretty well protected. Others, um, much, much less so. Um, could you also um, maybe go into just a little bit more detail on the uh, incentives that farmers or ag land owners would have to want to protect them? Well, in the case of the most recent, um, I mean, the land trust again is about conserving land. Um, we use a, a tool called a conservation easement quite a little bit to um, incentivize landowners to give up certain, the, the, the rights they would have to do certain things on their property uh, in exchange for some kind of a benefit. And in, in the case of the deals we've done most recently, we've managed to, um, you know, pull together millions of dollars of, of, of federal and state funding to pay landowners not to grow grapes, for example, on hillsides that are grazed by cattle now that um, otherwise would end up providing no CTS habitat at all because they'd be, you know, plowed and, and uh, grapes aren't managed for ground squirrels. Those two things are not compatible. If CTS and cattle get along pretty well, grapes and ground squirrels don't. So, um, in that case, we have uh, deliberately tried to find money to just pay what is essentially fair market value. If, if, the, if the rancher wanted to sell his land off to the neighboring vineyard, uh, what would it be worth? And then we try to figure out a way to come up with the money that would, that would compensate him in a, in a fair and uh, reasonable way. Um, in other cases, there are people that have um, development plans that involve proposed impacts to CTS. And in some of those cases, uh, you can find other places that have CTS habitat that's unprotected and put it under a conservation easement, thereby balancing the impacts in one place with really great conservation that happens someplace else. And the key to all of that is always to get the ratio of the, the, the habitat that's impacted or destroyed 
to be offset by a much greater number of acres or a greater number of ponds or however you choose to, to, to describe it. But you wanna make sure that you get a lot of bang for your impact buck out of that conservation transaction. We don't wanna be enabling people to destroy endangered species habitat. We wanna make sure that the, the transaction really generates a net positive, a real strong net positive to deal with a critical issue. You know, when animals go on the endangered species list, it's not for fun. They're, they're in dire straits. And so you need to kind of come up with, um, with aggressive solutions. By the same token, you know, it's, it's one thing to say we need to protect them. It's, and, it's, and it's in that same vein to say that there are laws that require us to do so. But finding real opportunities for that uh, requires some careful thinking and some relationships with people who in the past might not have thought of conservation as a way to secure their family's future financially, but really just the opposite. So there's a whole conversation that has to take place that is about people. And I suppose that's the thing that, you know, I hope, I hope that in a presentation like this, and I hope that in the work that we do as a land trust in general is, is something that we do effectively, which is that, you know, we talk about our perpetual conservation. We imagine that it's sort of, it's that thing because it says so in the conservation easement or it says so in the document or the contract or the deed that protects the land forever. But it's not the paper that provides the protection forever, it's the people that come along in the future who do two things. In the case of the land trust, they guarantee that we're not going away. We're gonna be here to monitor and enforce and make sure you do what you promised to do uh, whenever it, it was that you entered into the, the contract, the conservation easement or other, other mechanism to ensure protection forever. But the other thing is that we hope to influence people's minds generally so that people in the future continue to appreciate that this stuff is important, it's worth doing. The conservation doesn't ever stop. It's like being on a bicycle. You stop, you will go in the ditch. You have to keep pedaling. And um, it's not enough to kind of rest on, on some sense of satisfaction that you've got some acres produced if you don't continue to do the things that make sure that the, the quality of the land that's protected within the four corners of that property description still maintain its value. I sometimes say that, that a lot of people involved in, in habitat um, restoration and protection of, of endangered species, they're focused a lot on the, the wine that they are making. They wanna make really sweet, juicy, valuable wine. And the land trust wants to make sure that the glass is always big enough to accommodate that, that good, important work that creates the thing inside the, the, the vessel. But the land is always the thing that's gonna be underneath everything else we do in terms of whatever lives there in the future. Perfect. Well, I guess if we don't have any extra questions, I just want to thank you guys for attending. We are a small group today, but I still learned a lot. Um, we're really excited for our next Lunch and Learn that we're having um, next month on June 15th. Uh, our speaker is going to be Dr. Anna Alvarez. She's the Deputy General Manager of the East Bay Region Park District. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and read some of her facts because there's a lot of things that she's done. Um, but she regularly speaks um, at parks, programs, and community facilities. Uh, she's received San Francisco's Green Pioneer Award and serves on the Board of Counselors for the University of California's Natural Reserve System, um, and is also the Vice Chair of the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authorities Advisory Committee. So she's incredibly qualified, um, and she's gonna be speaking to us about how land conservation works in um, collaboration with basically just creating healthy communities through natural resources and parks and how that all kind of connects together. So we're gonna be advertising that soon, but uh, I would love all of you to attend as well. So thank you again for coming and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Thank you. All right.